Hello everyone, welcome, welcome, especially to our new subscribers. We actually have some new ones. Welcome, dear Edmond Dantes. It is wonderful to have you here. You are a part of this little mausoleum of wonder. Let us open with a mission statement from Eddie. This is beautiful, listen. Your worldly possessions and mortal vestures will pass, but you are a reflection of divine consciousness. You are an immortal being whose growth and splendor knows no limits. This is our author of Unfolding Consciousness. This is the mission statement, okay? A mission statement from Eddie. Your worldly possessions and mortal vestures will pass, but you are a reflection of divine consciousness. You are an immortal being whose growth and splendor has no limits. Love it. I feel so good to read that. That is the whole reason for Eddie writing this text. That's the whole reason that I'm doing these book studies with you. It is to understand that there is much, much more to our stories, that there is hope, and that if it's not okay, it's not the end, and that we don't end because death is merely a transition. So there's so much more, so much more. So today we're going to continue through symbolism, the language of the mystery teachings. That is our subject. We are in volume three, all right, on page seven of Unfolding Consciousness, exploring the living universe and the intelligent powers in nature and humans. Some of those latent powers, that's what we're doing over on Mental Magic. But listen, this is a colossal four volume set by Dr. Eddie Billamoria. Remember, ebooks are now available, thank goodness, globally, wherever you find your ebooks. And the links are down below for you. I've got Apple and the UK Amazon down there for you, but they should be $24.99 in most local currencies. And hold tight because audiobooks are coming, condensed versions, study manuals, paperbacks, and so much more. They're on the way as well. This has only been out for a year. So if you'd like to skip ahead and go directly to the reading of the book, just click the blue timestamp down below that I put there for you. This is book study 43. We are going to go to 52. We're going to do a whole year of these. So don't forget, you can get 25% off for you, you see crew, 25% off this hardback set, the four volume set. Just type, I want my copy in as your discount code when you are shopping on the Shepherd Walwyn publisher website. I've got that link down below for you too. So yay. Let's get started. Our yellow post-it study notes for today are, and these study notes are in the corner of each page as you go through this massive manual. A maze is not a meander. Ptolemaic astronomy depicts the incarnation and excarnation. Yes, excarnation. It has no bearing on physical planetary orbits and celestial beings on incarnation and excarnation. So let's begin. Okay, we're going to be talking about the labyrinth and the forest. Think about it, the labyrinth and the forest, from indecision and confusion to resolution. The labyrinth and the forest are universal symbols from the West and the East, respectively, for depicting our ordinary mortal existence. Eddie writes here, the popular meaning intuitively suggested by both symbols of the forest and the labyrinth is confusions, perplexities of everyday life. We're in one right now. If we're alive, we're experiencing our own labyrinth and forest without illumination, without being able to see where we're going, hopefully revealing a straight and narrow path ahead. So the symbol of the labyrinth, this section is a summary of Eddie's article, which is called Dante, Ptolemaic Cosmology, the labyrinth. Now there are two types of labyrinths. I did not know this until I read this. So there are two types of labyrinths, two typical types, a multi-cursal labyrinth, which means having more than one exit or more than one route through the entire thing from the center to the outside. This is also the traditional maze. Paths branch out into other paths that branch out further. That makes it difficult, if not impossible, for we, the traveler, to ever reach the center. By contrast, there's a unicursal labyrinth or meander, has only one path, which however it may twist and turn, ultimately leads with no dead ends to the center. So the labyrinth at Chantre Cathedral in France is a meander, while the one at Canossus in Crete is definitely a maze. Eddie writes here, or is it? So let the tale unfold. There is a double meaning behind the Cretan labyrinth at Canossus. And a side note here, we went to Crete. I was in Crete in March. I went to Canossus. I was there. Unbelievable. I'm going to hold up this. It's not, can you see this? This little piece right here? <laughs> this is from the ground near a chair that they said um, was from Atlantis. So I don't know if you can see that very well. That's not important, but it was gorgeous. Absolutely amazing. Uh, Canossus, over 7,000 years of human history. 
Anyway, when we were there, I didn't see a labyrinth when I was at Knossos. I didn't see one. Some say the labyrinth was in a nearby cave, or perhaps the labyrinth was actually inside the palace, which is now just beautiful ruins, or the labyrinth could represent the journey to Knossos to find your way home. Anyway, it was gorgeous and ancient, and my heart goes out to everybody who suffered in Greece, all of the fires and the floods. It's just been dreadful there this summer, but uh, sending so much love there to Greece, and of course, everywhere. There's so much suffering on Earth. That's why we're doing these, because this is to ease the unnecessary suffering of all beings. Anyway, the Cretan legend and symbolic meaning behind the slaying of the Minotaur by Theseus is well known. Here, we only emphasize that mythology demands that the labyrinth at Knossos had to be a maze. There was no doubt that unless we entered the maze with a clue, remember what a clue is from last week's episode, a clue, C-L-E-W, which is the thread that leads back to the exit. It's a clue. That's where we got the word clue. Anyway, thank you, Jonathan, for your contribution on that. Uh, we would soon become lost in its forked passages and get devoured by the Minotaur, which would leave us pretty much forked. However, the historical labyrinth at Knossos can be seen on early Cretan coins and pottery from an altogether different angle. Now, the design is not to be seen as a maze, but actually a meander with seven circuits. So Eddie says here, amazing. Take a look at this. Why this contradiction between the mythological maze and the historical meander? Why seven circuits here? Well, when we enter into terrestrial life, when we incarnate, we are indeed in a labyrinthine maze of all kinds of experiences, are we not? It's true. We do not know which of many paths to take, do we? And we have to learn to control our personal minotaur. Now, what is that? The minotaur represents, you know this, come on, it's our lower selves. So that sense-driven appetites do not get the better of our higher nature. We've talked about this so much. When we succeed in disciplining or slaying, in other words, the traditional term, to overcome our lower selves by finding the clue, and using the sword of our mind to cut through our encumbrances, our path ahead becomes clear. Our personal maze has been transformed into a meander. The labyrinth is therefore the symbolic pattern of our coming into birth and our coming out of birth, excarnation. As we shall see, Eddie says here, by constructing and then walking through the historical labyrinth at Knossos. So building the historical labyrinth at Knossos. Let's take a look at this historical labyrinth, okay? Now, I was there, I didn't see it. It wasn't there anymore, but anyway, it's thousands of years. Meaning the meander at Knossos. We obtained seven circuits, which we may label, okay? Working from the outermost to the innermost, going from the outside of the circle to the inner. We have Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon, with Earth at the center. None other than a depiction of Ptolemaic cosmology. Now, the Ptolemaic system is made fun of a lot, Eddie says here, of course, because uh, of an inability on the part of modern astronomers to understand the distinctions between the heliocentric, where the Sun is the center, and the Ptolemaic systems, where the Earth is the center. Okay, pay attention. Heliocentric is concerned with the physical layout, the physical planets and the distances from the sun. The physical, okay? The latter, the Ptolemaic, has nothing to do with their physical orbits or physical planets at all. Instead, listen, it is the psychological orbits, meaning spheres of influence of the sun and the planets depicting incarnation and excarnation of the soul and its relation with various planetary influences that make up the inner non-physical principles. Now, I'm going to say that again. Eddie writes here, heliocentric is concerned with the physical layout, the physical layout and the distances of the planets from the sun. The latter, Ptolemaic, has nothing to do with physical orbits or physical planets at all. Instead, it is the psychological orbits, meaning spheres of influence of the sun and planets, depicting the incarnation and the excarnation, born and dying, moving forward, and its relation with the various planetary influences that make up the inner, non-physical principles. Side note here, if you Google excarnation, okay, you're going to find out you'll get sky burial and things like that. That's what it looks like online, but that's sky burial. You know what that is, where 
the organs and the flesh is removed from the body and it's kind of like the ultimate in recycling, like the birds come and eat you and then that's the way they dispose of the body. Anyway, that's not what Eddie's talking about when he says excarnation here. So walking into and out of the Cretan labyrinth and leaving our incarnation, which is excarnation. Let's take a look at this photo here. Uh, this is walking into and out of the Cretan labyrinth and leaving our incarnation, which is our excarnation. So taking a look at this labyrinth, you see here, let us leave the fixed stars. Eddie says, let's leave that and let's look into the labyrinth as if we we're going to be born on earth, which we were, we've done this before. We shall assume that we are old souls. Not all of us are. Some of us are very young, <laughs> but the first circuit we encounter is not Saturn here. Look at this. The first one we encounter is Mars going into the labyrinth. You see we're in Mars, for it is the passion. Mars represents passion and desire for physical life. The force of Tanha and Trishna. I hope I'm saying that right. Tanha and Trishna that draws us into carnation. On our way then, keep following me, we pass through the circuit of the moon, which symbolizes the model body, the etheric body, upon which the physical body is molded. Now the last circuit we encounter before falling on to Earth is Venus. Now, Venus, appropriately so, this planet symbolizes intuitive wisdom and insight. Venus is the morning star, okay? Anyway, it is said that just before birth, we have an intuitive flash of our life ahead. So we get a life preview. You don't just get a life review, you get a preview. We've had it. And as we journey into incarnation, each planet bestows some of its qualities on our incoming soul. At death, the reverse occurs and we head back and we hand back those borrowed qualities to the planets as we in turn ascend. So Venus is now the first circuit, the first circuit we encounter as we experience experience a review of the life we have just lived. And Mars is this time the last planetary circuit we pass through as we must let go temporarily of the thirst and desire for earthly existence. The planets in the Ptolemaic system as mirrored in the labyrinth, therefore indicating the order in which our life principles are activated as we incarnate and the order in which they must be shed as we excarnate our labyrinth of experience, which is Earth. There you go. Does that make any sense? I hope so. It's best to revisit these. And if you don't mind my babbling, you can uh, play them and replay them. That's what I do. I listen to them over and over and over again. I listen to the ancient texts. I listen to unfolding consciousness. You can put on robotic voices if you want. The AI is amazing for read back right now. Or you can listen to these lessons on repeat. Um, there's 42 of them before this. We're going to go to 52. I'm going to do a whole year of them. I'm not sure if this is the right way to do it. Uh, but I'm just going to try. We're going to do a year of them. And there's other things happening on this channel. There's another way we're going to be studying these. That's coming with the Academy Sophia. Also coming up, if you've made it this far, thank you for staying for the whole video. Uh, Tim Wyatt is going to be joining us for a whole series next month on death, our favorite, because through understanding death, we learn the meaning of life on death, reincarnation, and karma. We're going to do four episodes with Tim. We also have the Mental Magic series, which happens on Saturday nights, and Mental Magic written down by, um, well, he goes by so many pen names, William Walker Atkinson. You might know him as Yogi Ramasharaka or one of the three initiates of the Kabbalion. Anyway, um, we do a series with that here because that is what the main people want. People want the latent abilities I want to be psychic. I want to be telepathic. Anyway, there's a reason we have these abilities and there is a responsibility for which we should use them for. Most people, 99.999% want to use them for selfish reasons, but they're to be used for the best interest of all beings. And we cover that in our mental magic series on Saturdays. And we're going to be back next week again for more of Unfolding Consciousness, Exploring the Living Universe and the Intelligent Powers of Nature and Humans. We're in volume three, which is Gazing Through the Telescope. Man is the measure of all things. So I love you very much and I'll see you next week. Thank you for being here with me. Mwah.